something loud. Loud. Third, second. Okay. Check. Yeah. One, two. Oh my God. You know, it's been years complaining about how loud I am. Three, four, five, six, seven. I can't even believe I this. Make sure I a good, good range. A good oh, all right. Okay. All right. Bye. Is that better? Yes. Jesus. It's all right. It's all right. Okay, good. Uh, recording. Hello. <laughs> Hello. Oh, I, let me put my, my headphones on so I can see. Put your headphones so you can see. Yeah. What? No, never mind. Are you just making fun of me? It's best not to know. Yeah. I want to see the sausage being made. <laughs> Good evening. It's Saturday night. It's Saturday night. We're doing this on Saturday instead of Sunday. Hey. Um, uh, so, if, um, yeah, we're all structured. We all have a structure now, so we're all organized. <laughs> <laughs> that's really cute yeah uh, organized we have so, I have so many notes that uh, that are, we're gonna like just delete most of them Sk- yeah, you know, know, we're gonna skip most of them <laughs> I don't know if you guys are gonna like it better when we're organized this is, this is already <laughs> turned into a nightmare we have too many topics this week yeah, so yeah. a lot's actually happening um, mm-hmm. at the same time that nothing is nothing's happening nothing's moving forward yeah so um if you would like to skim over your thing, I'll go first. And yeah. um, I, I'm, this is the what we're reading section. Yeah, go, you go first. Go ahead. All go right. Ahead. So I have finished reading Elizabeth Warren's New York Times bestseller, A Fighting Chance. Riveting. And um, actually, I'm offering it up to any reader who would like it. If you get us your uh, mailing address. It's yours. It's yours. I'll mail it to you. Because I don't actually want to keep it in my permanent library. We have four thousand books. We we don't we don't have more books. <clears throat> yeah. So unless it's really compelling and it's likely that I'm going to read and enjoy it again, I I try to get rid of stuff. I guess I could technically have gotten this from the library. <laughs> 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 he says after 4,000 books suddenly realizing that libraries it exist <laughs> oh wait um, but our nearest oh, library is like <laughs> over 10 miles away now it's our, 15 miles away it's fi- actually located in a different county our, our, our public library the one we're allowed to get cards for is 15 miles away and so you know the, while there's one I think less than 2 miles I mean, like technically you could walk there from here yeah it'd be a long walk but you could walk there from here but we can't use that one nope it's very confusing. Anyway, so I mean, uh, uh, this is one one of many reasons that I often just buy books instead of. Um, plus, the other re- being like a Libris, where I can get like you know three dollar books. Ching. Well, you can, you can get the book for less than the library fine that you'd have to pay. All right, <laughs> when I when I forget to return it, right. or the kids tear the cover off, yeah, or whatever which is a thing. they're gonna do. Okay, so the last chapter, I only really want to talk about the last chapter, is called The Battle for the Senate, and uh, we were almost to that chapter by the time I left off last time. Um, it's 64 pages long, I'm sorry. and um, it is a bit of a slog. I found some points to be interesting. So she, she talks about meeting folks on the campaign trail, and... Um, some of the stories are touching and some are sad and some are infuriating. I want to cite one in particular. Um, As the group broke up, this is page 229, a man in his 60s came over to me. He was thin with the leathery skin of someone who had worked outside for many years. He wore a Vietnam vet's cap that was frayed on the right side of the bill. He'd probably grabbed it there a million times. He didn't smile and his voice was flat. I looked for clues. Maybe a little hostile? I wasn't sure. Yeah, you're talking about building a future, he said. But what about transgender? What about them? Hmm. Now he looked full-on angry. (laughs) Wow. Uh, That seemed to fall out of the sky. I felt the instinctive need to crouch as if we were about to get into a fight. Hmm. I said just as flatly, we build a future for all our children, and that means transgender children, 
all our children, no exceptions. He held my gaze for a moment and then said, damn right. (laughs) (laughs) That's kind of funny. Okay. It's kind of funny. And she's sort of lampshading the fact that in issues like this, you know, this isn't her her uh, wheelhouse, right? Yeah, you no. know, these things really aren't her wheelhouse. Right. But she's trying to be uh, inclusive, you know. Yeah, yeah. And so um, he went on to explain that he had a grown son who was transgender. In a million years, you'll never know the special kind of hell he has gone through. I want someone who fights and doesn't back off. I relaxed. A future for all our kids, everyone. This was a fight I was ready for. So, you know, that's touching language. Uh, (laughs) But you got to wonder, like, how well equipped is she on these issues? And the answer is, this is this is not her her thing, right? This is not her. And you know, I don't blame her for being a little taken aback when this guy is kind of comes at her with this menacing attitude. You know, right? But. um, Anyway, it's just it's another uh, example of the meeting meeting America on the campaign trail, and there's quite a few little incidents she cites, including uh, a guy with a millennial son who killed himself over his student loans, you know, and uh, all kinds of stories like that. It's really um, it's it's pretty sad. One thing I actually learned about uh, from this chapter, though, is something called the People's Pledge. Have you heard of this? Uh. Remind me, I think I have, but yeah. During their campaign, uh, her, her campaign and Scott Brown's campaign made a written agreement that if outside groups like Super PACs or Crossroads, you know, Carl Rove or whatnot, uh, yeah, was yeah. contributing contributing money to one of them and not the other, um, they would make it kind of a, a, a shoot-yourself-in-the-foot pack, a shoot-yourself-in-the-foot pact, Packed, right where the uh the one that was the not the, how did it go <laughs> whoever was the beneficiary of the outside donation right would donate half that amount to the charity of the other candidate's choice oh okay I, yeah i think that's how it went let me i had not heard of this but it sounded, no, I've not heard of it. It sounded no. interesting uh In January, Brown and I started talking about doing something big and even a little radical. There was no legal way to stop the outside groups from running ads, but eventually the two campaigns signed on to a deal with Real Teeth. Both candidates pledged that if any outsiders came in to help us, we would penalize ourselves. The penalties would carry real weight. Whoever was helped by a super PAC ad would dip into our own campaign contributions and give money to charity. We worked it out so that if Carl Rove ran $1 million in ads against me, Brown's campaign would have to give $500,000 to the charity of my choice. So the, the person who was hurt by the ads right. would have to, uh, wait a minute. The person who was, <laughs> who was helped by the helped ads, by the ads would, would, act, would, um, would have to give up half give up the, the value, value of the ads. Right. Yeah. And so, if someone ran an ad in favor of uh, from outside in favor of one candidate or the other, or right. a negative ad, right. they would be punishing the person they were trying to s- support. Correct. And so, apparently, this worked. Uh, she describes it as uh, the same is true in reverse. In effect, we each pointed a gun at our own feet and then said to outside groups, "Don't come in any closer, or I'll shoot." I'll shoot. <laughs> Anyway, it's slight, it's, I find it slightly confusing, but apparently this held through the entire campaign and they didn't have like uh, crossroads running attack ads in this campaign. Uh, this is, so uh, I guess this was big in 2012 uh, in this campaign and apparently it's been discussed for other campaigns. I don't know if it's been used successfully in any other yeah. Any other campaigns? I don't think so. I've, I've actually not really heard much about that. But it's called the People's Pledge, and I, I found that interesting. It seems like a promising way to try and fight off outside uh, super PAC influence. I have to say, uh, also, in this chapter, she sets up by checking in every once in a while uh, the story of how her old hound dog... Oh, God. 
Yeah, you were telling me about that as you were reading it, and I was just... Uh, how her old hound dog Jeez. sadly died just five days before the election. It Was it in her truck? Did he uh, die in her no, truck? No, but it's, you know, I understand people really love their dogs, but the way this was set up where he keep, kept having these health crises and then they knew he had leukemia and he was on medication and, you know, you, you just get a little update every once in a while about how he's doing. And it's just like, come on. I mean, yeah. I, I appreciate that she was sad that her dog died, but she didn't need to tell to make like the arc of this chapter like dramatic about whether the dog was going to make it another a few more months or not right she didn't need to well i guess that's i guess that's how she tried to make the chapter more appealing to a reader who wasn't that interested in the politics but it feels reading the book if you're not interested in the politics it seems it seems it just seemed very manipulative to me and kind of cheap and i like yep that's very sad bite me (laughs) i don't know it's a good thing we're not cynical and mean. No, not cynical and mean. I don't know. It's just there are lots of ways she could have told the story that would have felt emotionally honest, but didn't feel like she was setting you up to cry, you know. So, <laughs> yeah, I actually just don't have a lot of patience for for that sort of thing. That sort of thing. No, no I don't either. Yeah. But so what I'm left because really I want to hear about the campaign, you know, the details and the policy and things like the people's pact which was interesting to me what i'm left with so i finished the book um what i'm left with is this feeling that she wasn't actually really that great for the senate although a lot of people wanted her to run yeah people like people like being able to vote for her and people they, like her being in the senate i don't think it's a good use of her talents or, or gifts they like her being in the senate they see her as an agitator and someone who's standing up for them and yeah. and that's all well and good but i don't think she's really that effective there i really think she belonged as head of the consumer financial protection bureau which was the the yeah. the um agency that she came up with you yeah. know and so to me the villain of this story is actually Barack Obama. Well, he's a villain of a lot of stories. He, yeah. w- he would not risk any confrontation over her appointment Street. fight and even would not risk uh, what might happen if he tried to uh, install her by recess appointment. Right? right. And so he met with her and was very polite and all this, but basically told her it wasn't going to happen. No mas. And this is an example of Obama, this alleged progressive, again, as he had did many, many times. Pre compromising. Pre capitulating, refusing to even engage in the upcoming fight that he knows is upcoming because he, he's trying so hard to be i don't know fair and balanced or what i don't even know what i i can't even yeah i got nothing for that. <clears throat> to n- i don't know i don't want to get into a make it a racial thing but to not seem uppity you know to not i, I guess to not trigger all the the fox news viewers but I, i'm not sure why he's worried about fox news viewers they're yes. not the people who put him in office and they're not going to support him no matter what he There's does nothing he could, it's so, it's same thing with all of this stuff all of these bills all of this these things he did not stand up for that did he feel that if he went along enough that eventually he'd be he'd get some approval instead of them just well, moving on to the next Right, next the, the ridiculous, the next ridiculous critique that didn't make, make any, any sense. sense. Well, no, no, it, it's this is why I don't think the Democrats actually have any interest in winning. They, they they appear not to be interested in winning to me, and because that's not a strategy to appease the people that didn't vote for you, wouldn't vote for you, and aren't going to vote for you. How is that a strategy? Yeah, yeah. And like, and to appease them at the expense of the people who did vote for you, on the off chance that maybe they'll be nice to you on yeah, the news yeah, sometime. Yeah, it's what, it's really, it doesn't even make sense. It's a strategy. Leaves you scratching your head as to why he would be do all the, all this like pre capitulation. Right. Yeah. So no, I, I I can't understand. And frankly, it's that pre capitulation at the top 
that cost the, de- the Democrats so many legislative seats in both federal government and state government over the last 12 years. I mean, it's been an absolute hemorrhaging. Yeah, yeah. At, at, at these le- on the legislative level. Yeah, it has. So at, in no way has this strategy helped them. They c- are not turning out votes. I mean, right. yes, so, yeah. yes, there's gerrymandering. Yes, there's yeah, all this stuff that's yeah, suppressing no. votes and all that. That's true. But if they really were turning out votes, voters, voters in, in large numbers, they would overcome these barriers. These barriers. And there are a lot of people who just aren't voting, right? Yeah. Who flat out aren't voting. So it's a strange strategy. I don't comprehend this strategy unless the strategy is to enrich the elites only. Yeah, it does. It only makes sense in that context. That's the only context yeah. in which it makes yeah. sense. Yeah. Outside of that, it makes no sense whatsoever as a political strategy. So right. your political strategy is to lose every time? Right. So I, I don't see War, uh, Warren running for president again, no. except maybe. Maybe she would. Maybe she would. I, I doubt it. But I really I really would like to see her in the CFPB. You know, I think she oh, belongs yeah. there. In All the right. final chapter, she sort of, uh, it's a revision of the book. She brings in some recent stuff going on and talks about oh, how yeah. the fight is still going on. And just continued. basically everything she's talking about is in her wheelhouse. It's these issues right. with financial protection, right. which is important. Yeah, to think. Right? So just while I was finishing this up, I'm uh, this week I've been hearing news about how a CFPB-like uh, oversight has been overturned, and now um, consumers mm-hmm. are going to uh, have to submit to mandatory arbitration if they have... And they're not allowed to sue credit card companies or banks. Oh. Right. And I've got several links on this. Yeah. Uh, from The Intercept. Um, Jeff Flake and Bob Corker joined Trump to upend a major consumer protection. I'm not going to read that article, but... Um, well, to, to you, dear listener. To, 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 the, to the... I'm not going to read it on the podcast here, but I'll include a link, I think. Uh, so and this is this was a big thing, and Wall Street jumped in and they they uh, sent oh, yes. Treasury actually intervened in this and wrote a report and this is Mister uh, Lego Batman. Oh yeah, this is Mnuchin mm-hmm. uh, getting his getting his um, game on, getting his uh, himself uh, right into the the swamp here to. Uh, Anyway, so this is a horrible, uh, this is a horrible ruling. It's a mm-hmm. horrible new new law. Yeah. Oh, arbitration is bad. You you don't want to have to go to arbitration with your credit card company. No. You need to be able to sue them in court. You need to be able to sue them, and uh, it yeah, consumers don't come out well. In mandatory arbitration. In, in no. arbitration, no. they they lose like over ninety percent of the time. Yeah. And they lose big. Yeah. So it's not cool at all, really. And I don't I don't know that if she had been head of the CFPB that she would have been able to do... Do anything about that? Anything about this. But I just uh, I have a feeling that maybe she would have been better at... That's where she would have had some teeth. Yeah, yeah, at heading this kind of thing off, she's maybe. Li- literally, she's pretty much defanged in the Senate. I, and That's what it seems like. And she was tweeting. Was she was yeah. tweeting about this issue. I'm like... Yeah. Yay, she's tweeting about this issue. Tweeting. Because, you know, that's how we do, apparently that's how we do law now. That's how there, we legislate. There, you know, there may have, given the the pop, the uh, the balance in the, the Senate, there may have been no, nothing for it, really. But, right. Um, but, but uh, no, there I, is. But, Pen, no, it was, it was actually close. Pence had to jump in and vote to break the oh, tie, wow. which doesn't happen that often. Not that often. And, of course, he, you know, like... <laughs> We all know how we voted. The no, it, it's. I think her work in academia and her work in law was really good work. Yeah, yeah. I would have liked to see that continue, and if there was any role for her in the federal government, it was in the Protection Bureau. Mm-hmm. Um, but that's you know that sh- that ship has sailed. Yeah. So you know. So so anyway, I finished the book. You can have it if you want it. It's not staying on our shelf. Nope. Um, uh, a little frustrated with the book, 
So, yeah, you know, but hey, it's it's interesting political reading if you're, you know, lean liberal. It is interesting political reading. So, mm-hmm. um, I would unfortunately, I unfortunately have to rep- report that we don't have a walk of the week yet. Not yet. We have a walk of the week planned. We have a, a walk planned, but we did not get a walk in, in today. No, it's our, it's, well, it's my favorite park in Michigan, um, County Farm Park. It, uh, I lived, right close by it for a very long time we used to live just just a block and or walk so there. best day of my life was in that park it was a great great walk so um we we had a lot of wonderful walks there we used to take sam and, and veronica when sam was two he would walk several miles in there he would just pick just, up a stick and just chug along and we kept oh, one we do like loops yeah yeah walk. we were scratching our head like is it safe for a two-year-old to walk this far like, won't he get it's like something it's like when he injure himself or when he get sick of this or start mm-hmm. crying or whatnot but no he yeah. just yeah, he, he just time. chugged along yeah and didn't ask to be carried or whatnot that's just, what i did my i was walking like a thousand miles in a year yeah that, that was that that period it was, it was yeah a good year. i think i i think i got to like eight the high 800s i you know I logged for almost two years when i was walking in downtown saginaw near our house i didn't actually log every walk right but my guesstimate is that I I walked over a thousand miles. Yeah, no, so. it's it's uh, it's good for you if you can do it. Because I was walking five six miles a day, um, quite frequently. So. Yeah. Anyway. So that's I think that's walk a week. That's I, walk I do a have week. A couple of reading things. Um, one thing I'm working through right oh, I'm, now. I'm sorry. I I went right from the reading topic through walk a week, and I didn't. Uh, did not stop. I no. did not stop. I forgot you had. We didn't get our notes coordinated. No, well, no. It's actually. I, it's not a long update for my reading list. It's actually only two things. Okay. And I don't have much to say. Um, one that I'm going through right now is uh, Foundations and Physical Therapy for Infants by Pro Ed Inc., which like is a ridiculous. It's it's actually like it's a, a publishing company. It's a publishing company that's producing something for occupational therapists and physical therapists. Hmm. Um, yeah, I'm not very clear about how they managed to do it that way but um it's been a good book they've got me helping ellie and ellie sitting up and crawling she's not crawling yet she's not sitting up yet but she's um developing the positioning to the do it precursors so all the precursors to that yeah so that's actually i that's actually my favorite kind of reading is this sort of how to how to and, and practical, uh, guides. practical guides yeah my favorite thing to read my uh, political reading was inspired by our main topic mm-hmm. um Conserving America? Question mark. Essays on present discontents by Patrick J. Deneen, who teaches political science at Notre Dame, and is often a speaker at the front porch or and a post uh, writer at the front porch. Was he at the event? You yeah, were, he was. Okay, cool. Um, he, uh, um, but this is it's a this book is about what exactly does America even have to cons- conserve? Is there any conservatism in America? And I largely know. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, when I see the way we bulldoze every anything that gets everything. old in our mm-hmm. buildings, in our t- downtowns, in our... That's who we are as Americans. That's who we are, and that's what, what we've done to our culture right. as well, and our institutions in general. So that's a, that's a little bit of reading that I think is uh, worthwhile. And I... I um, I think I had we had one more thing for like what we're up to and then I've got this other piece for the main part here on um that 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 article I was telling you about. Yeah. I uh, I have one more thing or No, no, I have one more thing. That you, uh, for what we're up to. Uh, what we're up to, yeah. The, the event I went to this morning the Oh, supposedly. yes, yes, yes. And then I think we're going to the article that uh Yes that I want to talk about a little bit. Okay. Or maybe Where a lot of it. <laughs> one, one of our, what, we got some feedback. We got feedback from Liz Stevenson that a half hour review is not a short review. <laughs> well, we were saying yeah, like, no oh, short. let's just talk a little longer just about this. Quick, yeah. And then like 30 minutes, minutes later, later, I'm still talking. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. I, you know, no, she said, she said she meant it affectionately. She enjoys listening to us, but I, I get it that, that we do, we do. Uh, and I, on. and I especially do. And I re- listening back last week, I know, found all these points where you were saying things like pointedly, like, let's make this a quick, like, like glancing at me and bugging your eyes out, a quick 
bit on this. I go, okay. Okay. And then, you know, 20 minutes later. 20 minutes later, I'm still talking. <laughs> so I'm sorry about that. Um, uh, we're, we're trying to do better. Uh, sorry, this is so unstructured. It, but so we're moving on to our to our main topic section, and I don't have a piece of music picked out for this. So no, no I'm, I'm in the process of trying to find some music clips that are appropriate. Appropriate, for these, and, uh, you know, free for use. Yeah, yeah. The the one piece before we move to the main topic was my little symposium this morning. The, soon coming up, I think on November eighteenth at. Uh, Ford Stadium, the, the stadium, the big stadium in downtown Detroit. Um, Father Salinas Casey, who is a popular figure around here, is being beatified. There's been a miracle uh, recorded and attributed to him. And so he's got first step to canonization is beatification. And the ceremony, the mass, is on November 18th. That's about three weeks from today. This is a big deal for lo- the local Catholic community yeah, to have this a happening big deal. here. To, to put it to put it in perspective, there are people who were flying back home to Detroit and bought tickets to fly, right? And then got online to buy their tickets to the beatification. They'd sold out in two hours. They'd filled the they'd filled the stadium in two hours. It's kind of amazing to me that like a religious yeah. ceremony will fill a stadium. And uh, do they do they literally go through Ticketmaster or what? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Yeah, and it's totally sold out. And I was, and I was being kind of lazy about it, think, thinking similarly. Yeah, I've, you know, I'll think it go? over. I'll, I'll think be it able over. To get tickets I'll later. get a ticket, you know, tomorrow, whatever. And they were just gone, flat out gone. I had friends call me on the phone, like they just sold out. They're sold out. <laughs> <laughs> you know, a scalper anywhere? So yeah, no, I don't know any scalpers. You're gonna go hang around the, the. Uh, in in front of the the show, like working your rosary, <laughs> like I need a miracle. I need a miracle. I need a miracle. Get me in there. <laughs> Come on, Salinas Casey, work me out. That, no. if, if you don't know, that's what everyone says in front of a Grateful Dead show. If they couldn't get tickets, they're like, I need a miracle. miracle. I need a miracle. Oh my goodness, that's not quite what I had in mind. Actually, I'd also planned to go to the symposium, and after I didn't get any tickets, I was kind of like, well, I guess there's always a symposium. Oh well. Um, I think I got the better end of the deal. This you really, was, you really liked the symposium. It was very good. Yeah. It was much smaller. It's maybe a hundred people were there, and they had a panel of folks that knew Father Solanus, and uh, lived with him in the monastery. And so, and th- he died sixty years ago. So some of these guys are were, elderly, were very elderly, recalling their experiences yeah. with him, or were very young, and um, at the time, at the time. And we're recalling uh, relatives and family members that knew him or that they were related to him through. It sounds like this was a much more, in a way, intimate experience than a giant stadium thing, yeah. right? Yeah, so. it was really quite powerful. That's cool. Um, and uh, we, we just, and I think the thing that was most compelling for me is there's this very pervasive thing in American Christianity where it's um, the, like the mega church thing. And you see that mega church personality kind of seeping through all of American Christianity. Oh, yeah. yeah. So even if you go to a very, um, very conservative Catholic church with the old architecture and the old mass, they still kind of treat it like the mega church with these huge speakers and these, <laughs> like they'll have, some of them will have these like pull down. Like projectors, and, yeah. yeah. Even in these very traditional architectural spaces, right? It's starting to feel like you're at a rock show. Yeah, yeah. And then they've got like uh, the music. Even if they're playing more traditional music, the music is so over the top. They've started to. If they're not doing actual rock music, even what they're singing, they've got singers who are imbuing it with a lot more like pathos and pathos. whatnot it's, it's, uh, it's more like pop music more of a performance yes. that, than church music it's is really intended to yeah. be yeah it's not participatory it's, it's performance and it was um and it's really become a problem for american christianity american catholics in particular because that really is not our charism yeah i'm not going to speak on what evangelicals do that's their business yeah um this whole we won't day, speak of them here. <laughs> this whole day really hit the nerve center of Catholicism as an intimate, lived oral oral tradition. Oral tradition, where the people who knew him communicated mm-hmm. his story to people who hadn't met him yet. Hmm. 
And they said, please go share the story. Tell about the things that happened, that you know, people, the experiences that people had with this man. Go, he was amazing. Go tell it on the mountain. Go tell. Go tell everyone <laughs> you know. And the powerful testimony of listening to people with their firsthand experience um, was just amazing and very edif- edifying in your own faith life. Because the thing they kept saying is, we're beatifying this guy. You would not have known he was a saint if you were in the room with him. He was like any other guy. He's just a person. That's kind of inspiring in its way. It gives hope for the rest of for us. The rest right? of us, right? Yeah. You, know, you played the violin badly and told stupid jokes, and <laughs> you know. And he was such a poor student that um, they actually didn't ordain him as a as a regular priest. He was a simplex priest because he couldn't pass any of his theology courses, right? So this guy, he was kind I, of. I had never. Can can you explain? Explain yeah, that. I had never heard of this. Th- this Not is a, that I'm an yeah, expert on. I, I'd never heard of it before today either, and it's a little bit wild. So the idea is, uh, his particular story was, he like dropped out of school at the eighth grade. Origi- went, originally. Originally. Yeah. Went back and finished high school and struggled to finish high school in his 20s. And then was trying to do um, basically a bachelor's degree in theology. And you're supposed to get a master's in divinity right, for the priesthood. Right, but the, you're saying the classes were all taught in Greek and Latin. The all classes were all taught in Greek and Latin. He didn't have a strong background at all in Greek and Latin and was basically failing all his courses. But he was doing great ministry work, and they kind of like coaxed him we're along. willing to look the other way. And he gets to the end, and they're going to get ready to ordain him. And like half the committee is, you know— he actually didn't pass any of his classes. He can't <laughs> ordain this guy. And the other half were like, but you know, he's got... He's, he's got something. He's got something. I really think... He, he called it a charism. He's got a charism. Yeah. He, you know, he's really got... Uh, I think he's got a calling to this. How can we not ordain someone who has a calling? Mm-hmm. And so they went back and forth, and they were deadlocked, and just sent a letter to the Vatican explaining their problem, and said, what do you think we should do? Hmm. And the Vatican wrote them back and said, ordain him a simplex to a simplex priest. And what that is, is a priest who, he says mass, um, he presides over, he says mass, he presides over weddings and funerals, baptisms, but he cannot preach mm-hmm. and he cannot hear confessions. Those are the two faculties that require a th- theology background. To be able to, to be able to like interpret scripture for people in public. Right. And to be able to like advise people while still staying you know, have confidence that whatever advice he's giving yeah. you is still theologically, theologically correct. correct. Yeah, so they they couldn't guarantee that. So <clears throat> ordain him a simplex priest and let him perform all those other functions. Yeah. And so he did. And his job in the monastery, every, pretty much everywhere he went, was really the the lowest job, the near lowest job in the totem pole. He was the doorman. Hmm. He was literally the doorman. People would come to the monastery and... Um, They'd introduce themselves, he would greet them and find out what they needed and where they needed to go. That's, again, like that gives hope for those of us who may not feel like we're at the top of our classes. <laughs> at the top of our classes, <laughs> at the top of our game. Um, yeah. And what it amounted to is by the end of his his journey, his, uh, I want to say career, but that's not really the way to think of it. Um, he's been several years in New York State. He spent more than 20 years in Detroit and came back to die in Detroit. And his um, his tomb is in Detroit. And um, when he was sort of infirm and had to retire from daily duties, he was uh, in Indiana for a while. But his... Um, um, <coughs> by that time, the one of the monks was saying, you know, so we saw him in the monastery every day and he was an ordinary guy, except... 80% of the phone calls that came to the monastery were for him. <laughs> you know, Most of our mail. He had an enthusiastic following. Enthusiastic but was for him. And once a week, people would charter buses from Detroit and areas around to come down and hope that he would take a few minutes to talk to them. Bring a whole, literally a whole bus They charge a whole bus of people. Because That's what would, remarkable. Yes, they would, come, they would come and talk to him and they would tell him, I've got this problem or that problem. And he would encourage them. Yeah. And befriend them. And that's kind of all he would do. <laughs> Which seems like people saw so people saw some kind of a spiritual depth to him that, right. that they didn't see it necessarily. They weren't in all getting his anywhere else. Co workers. <laughs> right. They weren't getting anywhere else. And um yeah. and that it meant a lot to them. And th- people were getting some kind of sort of spiritual guidance mm-hmm. from him 
that kept them coming back when they had another problem. Like, you know, so I've got this thing with my son. What do you think I should do? I said, well, let's pray about it, you know, et cetera. Or, you know, I think someone's going to die. Well, you know, can you pray for us? And, and he might say, and he would frequently say, you know, let's pray for a happy death. Rather than, so his encouragement was often very directed in that, mm-hmm. you know, let's prepare for the worst or, you know what, let's not belabor and worry about this. But the bottom line is, whatever happened in those interactions, people literally experienced God through him. Yeah, sounds like it. And so that's where his following came from. And his um, various ministries at the various Capuchin uh, friaries and monasteries were always um, flourishing because of his commitment to really just befriend people and encourage them. So it was a great symposium. I got the really long end of the stick and I didn't even know it. It was, I think, much better than a stadium mass. Yeah, and um, just a, really a beautiful experience. A good day. A good, well, I'm really, I'm really glad you got to go. Yeah. Um, so that's Father Solon's Casey. Uh, not a Detroit native, but a Detroit favorite. I almost got one of the shirts because it was like this hipster shirt. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> He's got this huge beard, you know. Oh, a, t- this, a, yeah, with t- a t-shirt shirt with his face on. With it. the face of the huge beard and the square glasses, and he was not. That's just how he looked. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't. Uh, it was like he, he wasn't the doing Che Guevara or something. No, no. That's just yeah. how he looked. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I think my topic for the week. Grace has a topic for the week. I do. How cool is that? Um, I spend a lot of time um, mocking liberals and kind of, you know, cynically. Um, <laughs> just rolling my eyes about liberals and you know that's kind of mean conservatives have a lot to answer for too so this is this is equal time saturday this is equal time saturday yeah excellent yeah yeah um you know i'm an equal opportunity um cynic yeah (laughs) everybody gets a little bit of my love and hatred um so this is a uh, article by matthew loftus uh on mere orthodoxy and uh, the title is Conservatism Fails to Act Responsibly, which, you know, we could stop there. You know? <laughs> it's just like, yeah, and. Yeah, and. <coughs> but I'll read a little bit and then kind of flesh out some of the details. His, uh, he's basically responding to an essay written by Kevin D. Williamson, published at uh, National Review. And in many ways, this essay represents mainstream conservatism's highs and lows. I think you just have to say National Review, and I have a sense for what, what it's like. At, yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, I'll, I'll read his introdu- introduction here. So last Friday, Kevin D. Williamson published an essay at National Review that in many ways represents mainstream conservatism's highs and lows. By Terrence Hilarious, insightful, bizarre, obnoxious, confused, and offensive, Williamson explores the ugly ways in which Trump and his cadre of right-wing media sy- sycophants now perform a vulgar, real American, air quotes, shtick, to distract from the fact that they have nothing of substance to say and their fans have nothing to be responsible for. His critiques of right-wing elites land beautifully, but he goes further to reveal an equal or greater disdain for the white underclass. Hmm. Um, I'm skipping some. One of the clearest lessons of the last past two years is that the, quote, conservative mu- movement has for some time been a large number of power-worshipping, Trump-loving sheep waiting for their Trump, corralled by a handful of ideologues, ideologues on the billionaire's ranch. ranch. Good now, Germans are useful idiots, similar yeah, that concepts. Kind of well, it's, it's my, that's my assertion for a long time now that, you know, 45 is not a... The world isn't falling apart because 45's in office. No. 45's no. in office because the world is falling right. apart. Right. It, it's that that's the phenomenon. Yeah. That this was ripe and, and just waiting. And he's he's for not he's not actually in charge of these people. No, he's not. Uh, yeah, it's questionable what it, what he is in charge of. Um barely in charge of his phone. <laughs> tweeting sober. I'm um, going on. Um he says Every traditional right-wing voting bloc has come apart at the seams. There's national security, economic growth, and moral majority. All those things are just 
they've metastasized, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. Where national security is just this authoritarian They're state. almost parties now. Yeah, they're almost parties of their own. Right. So, like the, pro, right. the pro-life voters, they're almost a separate party. A separate party of their own on their single issue. Yeah. Um, you know, the moral majority folks, the culture war people, yeah. right? They've That's their thing. And now and, the, the alt-right people, right? Right. And that's their thing, and they don't do anything else. Um, now, here's the thing about this and about what conservatism has been about. Okay, we're going to do national security. That's just us invading other countries. That's, what it's, that's all we're doing. That's that's what it's turned <laughs> okay, into. Going to economic growth. We're it, just going it to used give, to be about diplomacy. It used and, to be, right? And, and, you know, and assisting, you know, foreign aid. At it's least that was the of, idea, right? There's all kinds of, there was a lot to national security. It was a right. big topic. Economic growth is just really opening up the treasury to anyone who already has a lot of money. Yeah, if you got a lot of money, let's let us give you some more. Let's give you some more. And then the moral majority is just let's like this. Let's deregulate that for you. Just this sort of obscene, you know, screaming. Right? Now, I'm going to quote him here. If personal responsibility and tax cuts were the path to prosperity and virtue, <laughs> then Kansas and Alabama ought to be shining examples of governance. Shining cities on the hill. So, cities on the hill. But they're not. Movement conservatism has been tried and found wanting. It has degraded into a parody of itself nationally because all three legs it used to stand on can't hold anything up anymore. Mm -hmm. All true. Now, Williamson... But trickle-down economics. But, but... Yeah. Now, Williamson, um, the author of the article he's responding to, really kind of gets down and dirty about how you know, these underclass poor people are just disgusting. <laughs> and, you know, you can't, you can't tell them that someone else is responsible for their problems. They just need to take personal responsibility for what they've well, done. Isn't that just a ruder version of the hillbilly elegy message? It is. It's yeah. a ruder version of the same message, right? Yeah. Um, but that's wrong in three ways, right? Okay. This is his argument. This, this is, this is uh, our Matthew Loftus' argument. Okay. That Williamson is wrong because the crux of his thing is that we just can't be beholden to these hillbillies, right? <laughs> they just need to accept responsibility for for getting knocked up and, and overdosing. Drugs. Yeah, over, uh, dying of overdoses. Right, they just need to take responsibility for that. But that's wrong. Have you tried not being poor any I'm anymore? just asking. <clears throat> The first way is wrong relates to common tropes about welfare. The more poor people you know, the more you realize how very little they actually get from the government and how yeah. few of them actually get yeah. anything. Yeah. Right? And, and, you know, people are always shocked by the guy who's, who's running a scam, right? Who's doing something like so it's, it's somebody's actually cousin. Pr- it's pretty rare. It's pretty rare. Um, it's not, not my biggest concern about these... Um, Social safety net programs. Right, no, that's... By a long shot. By a long shot. And there's always these people who like to think to themselves that they, well, they know the poor, they see them every day. And they're like social workers and doctors and officers, right? Yeah, yeah. The people who see the poor have, at their worst. Yeah, yeah. Right? And and she had an expensive cell phone. Did you see that? She had an I- designer, I don't have an iPhone. Designer purse. I don't have a designer purse. <sighs> yeah. And Perhaps she was doing better a while ago. <laughs> just asking. And, or, did, and has a nice purse in part for job interviews. <laughs> just as a thought. Or maybe she likes purses and someone gave it to her. Sure. There's, it, there's know, all kinds There's of, all kinds of reasons. We can be on this all day. But that's, there's a sort of yeah. person who's like, oh, I know what they're like. Yeah. Now, I see them every day. Well, you know, when I was unemployed, hey, I had 20 guitars. Right, and we were getting food stamps. Have you ever tried to sell guitars, guitars? to raise cash? <laughs> yeah, it's slow work. Well, it's and it's you, you don't get much. No, you don't. It's not a mortgage payment. <laughs> no, you're like, really? I paid four hundred dollars for this, and you're offering me forty bucks. You know, huh. well, Thanks. I guess I'll take it. But or I really something. love this one. You know, right? The second way that Williams' statement is malignant and wrong is that it actively discourages friendships with the poor and praises the sort of ignorance that a statement is meant to lambast liberals for, right? Mm -hmm. Because if, you know, they just need to take responsibility, I mean, they don't need anything from you, least of all your (laughs) compassion, friendship, and support. I mean, let alone any kind of tax policy, let alone any kind of welfare policy. Right. 
But that's yeah. not a conservative value. The traditional conservative value is you should be getting the help from your own community. That yeah. You need, right. Right. And that would involve knowing these people and their struggles and what they're going through. Yeah. And actually putting yourself out for them. And putting yourself out for them. Yeah. And um, the, the and this is something I really admire about the Latter Day Saints that they do as part of their practice. Oh yeah, they do. Is, take, they do take care of their own. They really take care of their own. Um, you know, you're out of work, you're down on your luck. Your bishop comes and sits down and he says, "Okay, how are we going to work? Our, how are we going to work this out? What's going to happen?" Mm-hmm. And they come up with a plan. Yeah. And then they work the plan, and it's they have their own food banks. They have all kinds of exactly. Yeah. So they really they're on top of that kind of community support, and um, and, and it shows, you know. Um, and it's also very much about knowing the people who are in poverty and what's going on with them and less, arguably much less about judging or, and I don't, I sorry away from the word judging, but asking them to take personal responsibility. Yeah. Right. <clears throat> yeah. And in fact, if there's any personal responsibility to be had, I'm going to get to this. It's on the part of the rest of the community to take responsibility to care for their own. Yes. So, yeah. Um, what's this next thing? Oh, yes. The other the sort of flip side of this, right? Where you don't want to really have any compassion for these folks because, you know, it's of their own making, right? Mm-hmm. The flip side of this is that you don't want to be that person. Uh, well, and you feel it could be contagious. Could be contagious. Yeah. And really, <clears throat> these little hick towns full of heroin addicts and Lord knows what else, you need to get out of there Whatever the cost. You need to get out because if you don't, you'll probably wind up just You'll probably like wind them. up in the same position. So you need to get out they, of there. They know this, despite the fact that all their virtue signaling is about how much they aren't like these people. Right. Right. right? Um, and then similarly, in, in, in the same dynamic plays out in cities as in rural America, that it's the children who are the best students, the best athletes. They're going to use that to get the hell out and never come back. Yeah. As I was reading this, I was thinking about how that's actually was the arc of, of my life, you know. Honestly, yeah. I, I left, you know, I grew up in northeast Pennsylvania and Harbor Creek, Pennsylvania, and I left that place and I never, I, I went, to, went to get an elite education. Mm-hmm. I had, great, you know, to, to follow a career and all that. And... In some sense, I should go back and do something for that community. Well, they made you. But in a way, they made me. But there's, there's not work there that I that that you can do that I can do. And, and here's and the I'm thing: I'm not really. I don't feel comfortable there. You know. Well, and this is a, and this <clears throat> phenomenon is a positive feedback loop. And you. My family sure isn't going to be, you know, embraced with open arms there. Oh, you know. Yeah, my black family. It's one of those things. That'll yeah. go well. Well, you know, actually, didn't we go back to your, your family's Presbyterian church? Like, all the kids had married non-white women? That was interesting, wasn't, <laughs> wasn't that it? that weird? <laughs> yeah. It, 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 like, a, a number of friends I had from... From church. From church, from, 20, from yeah, high school, from high school. A- age. Right. Not close friends, but that but I people knew. You knew. Right. Yeah, they married Hispanic women. Uh, the the men, they, uh, they guys, they married Hispanic women, black women, whatnot. Yeah. Asian women. Yeah, Asian yeah. Asian women. Yeah, they did. Right. That was very interesting. So I guess if all of them came back, <laughs> it'd be a very different community. We'd have a very different community. Now, um, but that, if you think about it, is about as anti-conservative as you can imagine to take every resource the community has given you. And and leave. And it. leave. Take it and leave. Because honestly, how else are the virtues... If, in other words, let's just say that you are, your skills and your things that you've all learned and developed and gathered from the community you are re- virtues, You right? received all your... Uh, Bennett Book of Virtues, you know. Yeah, you've got uh, them all. Uh, you, you, your full complement of conservative family values. Right? So let, let's pretend that's the case. If you pack up and take them with you, who in the community is practicing those virtues to perpetuate them in the community? Who is running a business there right. to employ people right. in the community? 
how is that ever going to be self-perpetuating for the community from which you came? Yeah. And it can't ever be, right? And that's what this disdain for the poor and the marginalized does. Uh Uh-huh. People flee them. They flee. No, I'd be free. Because, oh, the way you, you frequently hear people talk about it, it's like the crabs pulling each other down and the right, crabs that. In right, the, the crab but bucket phenomenon. Yeah. That's actually really rational. The crabs that are being left behind know that if their best and brightest leave, they're, they're impoverished. They're impoverished, literally more, impoverished. More than already. More than they already were. Yeah. I know. I, it, it, this, I will say this article really got me thinking about how, like, like say I did try to go back what kind of a living could I eke out there with and what kind of a what what useful thing could I do with my my actual skills well this is the other part I, of I've, I've honed myself to a pretty pretty specialized esoteric skills. set of skills you know I mean right. I, I can't even keep a job teaching in a community college honestly you know yeah because you're really Esoteric skills and focus. Yeah, because right? I'm teaching above the, you know, what I have to say is above the level of the students who College are taking the seniors. upper level classes. Right. And that's, you know, that's its own kind of problem. That's its own kind of problem. But. Now, um, he goes on and he mentions, he gives a shout out to the American Solidarity Party and some of our radical ideas. Um, but most of all, Conservatism is doomed to degradation if conservatives neglect our pre-political relationships and do not use the freedom we have to be sympathetic and sacrifice for our neighbors. If that is not the first thing we're doing, if that's not where we're starting. Our pre Can you uh, maybe clarify pre-political relationships? So there are various political relationships you have or political um ideology that you have or, or policy well, alignments alignments and, and policy that you want and, to advance and groups you're part of right and groups you're part of or even as like an ideology ideology as a conservative right you've got ideas and policy that you want to see happen pre-political though he's talking about your family of origin your community yeah, you, of origin your family of origin but aside from that independent of that irrelevant to that mm-hmm Largely, there's your family of origin. There's your community of origin. There, there's your faith community. All those things are part of you before you have some kind of political praxis. Oh, before you even before you are even voting. Like, are voting before <laughs> yeah, you are yeah. a political person, right? Um. So and before you into the world as a conservative, and like are, are acting as a conservative, <clears throat> you come from somewhere. There are people to whom you are yeah, connected. Yeah, I, there is a lot of angst among conservatives, I think, over this, and this is why you have people like Vance writing hillbilly elegy. And the, Their the, prescriptions are maybe not helpful, but the angst is real. The angst is very real, and this is why the angst is real, is because they call themselves conservatives and yet function politically as liberals. Mm-hmm, yeah, yeah. Every ideal, everything they want to do in advance is a liberal policy. A ne- neoliberal, really. Uh, yeah. Uh, it, it's the advancing a, cor- a corporate interest rather corporate than... Corporate interest, and, you know, freedom at all costs. Rather than know. a... Or a libertarian. Right. Rather than a true community interest or and conserving an now, institution or understand a that libertarian as a political ideology outside the United States... Yeah. Is what everyone else in the world calls liberalism. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, right. right. Um, so we, we kind of conflate those words. And what you see in practice is that the American political sphere is only liberal and there's nothing else that's on the table to be considered. Um, so this is not actually the whole, me, the whole spectrum. The whole spectrum. So called spectrum. So I'm not, I don't want to go back into this place where I'm really discussing liberalism exactly. I'm talking about conservatism's discontent and and its brokenness because it's, um, it's schizophrenic. It's, it's not practiced. It's not, it's not being practiced and yet that's what you're calling yourself. It's got like this, like split identity. And there are these conservative values that are preached, but not practiced and preached, but not practiced and can't be, and can't be because there is no political, uh, uh, conservative political group advancing policy that would make it possible to practice that. There's nobody making it possible for you to move back home to where you came from. Yeah, that's a good because you can't because the, the political ideology is you can't do that on isolation because you 
are not autonomous. There, there's those. It, I you never think were. You never were. And you aren't really. You and know, you aren't despite really. all your all, all your values about all your um, values about individualism and yeah. etc. That's as a conservative, I don't think that's even true. You don't even well as a Catholic conservative, you don't believe uh, individualism is even a is even a, a thing a valuable valuable value thing. to have. I mean, I th- it's, I understand that there's it's a word and people mean something when they talk about it. Yeah, but it's it's conceptual. I don't think it's actually real. Mm-hmm. It's an abstract. I don't think it's a real. Um, so, That's the, by the way, this is the opposite of Thatcherism. Yeah, it's the the real opposite. And Reaganism. Abs- complete opposite of Thatcherism and Reaganism. Because her, her attitude was, well, there really aren't, you know, there aren't communities, there are only individuals. Only individuals, yeah. And and those individuals are basically commodities. That's... That's that's the deep part. <laughs> that's the deep part. And we'll go there another day. Yeah. But a conservative ideology, if it existed, mm-hmm. would be the engine working to make it possible for you to move because there's no such thing as you moving back but there's such a yeah, thing as unless, the community retaining gonna, its youth unless you're like oh you're morgan freeman and you've made your nut in hollywood now you're going to move back to uh, yeah that wasn't even his community it right? wasn't even his community but you're going to move into some small town and be a local celebrity and you know contribute to the community right but it, yeah if you're wealthy enough to to, to not to have just to do that. work no, I guess you could do that. Sure. And then you not, could do that as an individual. But as an individual. But that's not very realistic for, for the 99%. For most anyone. It's not realistic for the 99.9%. Yeah. So this idea is more that the community functions to retain its brain trust and functions to retain its youth. And no one's having that conversation. Cities function to retain their citizens and function to retain their economy and to keep it functioning, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, there's not some like abstract economy for which we're trying to grow, <laughs> right? No, it's this place that we're trying it, it to should keep be trying to grow, uh, grow and 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 develop sustainably, ideally, a, a real place. Exactly. For example, for example, here's <laughs> um, for all of their. <laughs> Liberté, Galité, and Fraternité, and yeah. their French Revolution. Yeah. Um, conservatism in French is really in France is is really deep, right? McDonald's had a hard go there for a very long time. Uh huh. Very oh, long. You mean time. cultural conservatism? Cult- cultural. They're cultural. Oh, sure, the yes. slow food yes. folks and all that. Um, and, you know, not just food. But. And if you think about some of these companies, <clears throat> they're. I wouldn't call them company towns exactly. But they have industries as a community, like Le Corset, and that's how the town functions. And it's something to which the town is committed. Yeah, yeah. Well, they're committed because they're slaving in the in the in the foundry. In the foundry, yes, yeah. they're very committed. Yeah. So we can talk now. Now, if we're going to move to the conversation there, now we can talk about justice in that frame. Right? Yeah, like the workers should own them. Worker but, justice and so on. So uh, now we can talk about justice in that frame. But that's a completely different frame than, say, those people there in that town having some sort of abstract commitment to growing the market generally. Yeah, yeah. Their interest that, is not in the, this growing the, the market. The national, international. Yeah, no, no. The Their trade interest, agreements and all that. Yes, yeah. is in that town and that foundry and that brand. And a place. And a place. This yeah. place and the people in it. And that's a really very different frame for thinking about the economy mm-hmm. and thinking about your politics. And there's almost no one doing it in the United States. There's a few people. I, I like to mention Strong Towns. Yeah, I like to mention yeah. Front Porch. I like to mention also the Institute for Local Self-Reliance. Yeah. Um, there, there are a lot of places doing this thinking, but they're disjointed. There's the EF, EF Schumacher Center, which I think just had a reorganization, and now there's a new economy center. Hmm. Um, but they're disjointed. They're not, they're nothing like the Heritage Foundation. Right. Well, which all these, these right wing like, think tanks, they're all funded by the Mercers and the Cokes yeah, yeah. and uh, outside well, or any of these, what these, I, I don't uh, even know the. Federalist? So, not the Federalist, the the new Center for New American Progress or something. Yeah. Like one of the left, the, the not left, but the liberal ones. They call themselves liberal, not right wing. 
It's it's hard to get straight the who's no who. No labels, folks. You mean not uh, not the lo- I kind of like the no labels, folks. They're trying to think. I'm talking yeah. about the Center for American Progress. Yeah, yeah. Those people, um, they're not any different or better. They they just kind of have different buzzwords. Yeah, they have different window dressing, but they're all working on the same project, right? I keep thinking of the DLC. Oh yeah, which was basically the the Democratic Party's suicide pact. <clears throat> but yeah, all these, all of them are working in the same two inch square window mm-hmm. of growing the economy. Yeah, of, of neoliberal of causes. Neoliberal. Yeah. yeah, that's all. That's the whole story. Yeah, of, of what's oh, good, you know, for good, good for business is good for America. Good for everyone. And people are kind of like. You know, they talk about open borders and kind of nobody likes that, you know? <laughs> and and people like try to like dress it up and reframe it as a as an immigration issue, right? Yeah. As welcoming refugees. People historically have not really, unless they're extremely xenophobic, like say, you know, hunter gatherer tribes that have been uncontacted. Now they're xenophobic. <laughs> they're shooting arrows at the helicopter that right. goes people, over the woods. People land on the coast and they come and attack <laughs> them and throw their corpses back into the ocean. Right? They're xenophobic. Yes. But historically, and I, I when I say historically, I mean over a very long arc of centuries, there's generally a standard of accepting refugees. Yeah. Right? The people there come, has been. There has been. Well, I mean, in my community in the 70s as as far back yeah. as the 70s i don't remember exactly what year the vietnamese uh, vietnamese boat people issued. welcome as refugees yeah yeah and i i'm talking and about our, way back even our know. little town was was funding people right you you know probably your church and probably your church is like yeah, right. you know uh, regional organizational right. body was and doing that too i think we even collaborated with methodists <gasps> So. Do they even put covers on their casseroles? <laughs> I just they, gotta wonder. They, they say trespasses instead of <gasps> debts when they That's... say the Lord's Prayer. It was it's really unnerving, honestly, whenever we'd go Are they over Catholics there. Catholics or something? <laughs> A bunch of papists over there. But no, that's just the seventies. But I mean, really, in terms of like Western culture, yeah, right. Yeah. Even Western culture, Asian culture, African culture, acceptance of refugees is not is, is largely a norm. There are some things that we would find strange, unusual, well, not our cultural norm, but it's a widespread cultural norm. I, I believe it is, and this is why, I like this nativist thing going on with the Republican Party now, is is. Just, it's really absurd. It's really absurd. Kind of kind of nauseating. Yeah, I mean But on the other hand, generally speaking, no one historically has really liked the idea of just open borders. Yeah. I, for economic reasons. Yes. For social reasons. Um it's, for it's, a lot of reasons. It's a, it's a bigger issue for states that have borders that people actually want to cross. Well, and that's the thing. It, it's it's a bigger issue for People that have borders that state for states that have borders, people want to cross right. for this so reason. Ask, I mean, ask a Texan how they. No, think about this though. The only reason people want to cross those borders, they are economic migrants. Yes. And it wasn't the people crossing the borders first; it was capital crossing the borders first, and that's all the open borders was ever about. Mm-hmm. It was about moving capital, mm-hmm. because people have never now liked. People open, are trying to are basically trying to chase. Trying to capital. follow the capital. Yeah. Right? So, no one's ever liked That's open borders because that means the rich can pack up and leave after they shit all over everybody. <laughs> so, that hasn't been a popular idea. It's called a, what is that? Ever. An Irish Sunday with a double Dutch twist. Or- <laughs> Ew. <laughs> I don't think the Irish that, come No, up that's with that exactly. how uh, uh, there there are all these terms for the tax arrangements that um, companies use to. Uh, oh. They move overseas. They become like uh, they they reincorporate in some other country, and then their right. American p- employees are just like some kind of subsidiary. But yeah. they're like incorporated in Barbados, and they have manufacturing in Ireland, and there are all these terms they come up with this for right. these tax. And th- they've managed to just extract this enormous amount of wealth and and not pay taxes. Not pay taxes on any of it. Yeah. And that's what open borders is yes. really about. And open borders has never been a popular policy for that reason. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. 
welcome of refugees has generally been a popular policy, historically, because if things are going well, there aren't a lot of them. Right. Right? Right. You're literally just helping a few people it's out. It's a few who are people. It's times. not actually that much of a burden Waves to your community. Of hundreds of thousands. Yeah. Yeah. But these open borders for capital yeah. have created so much destabilization that now we are talking about populations. Yeah. yeah. Well, and then we're, we're going to have climate refugees. Exactly. Yeah. That. Honestly, I think if we didn't have already have open borders for capital, we'd be having a different conversation about climate refugees. Uh huh. Because there's generally been a more positive, a more positive, more humane, understand, more humane yeah, understanding attitude. about that. So, a lot of these conservative ideals that are spoken about sort of vacuously and in this sort of um, rhetorical vacuum. Like build the wall. Like build the wall. It's just yeah. absurd things, right? They well, come I, from somewhere, and they was, have. What was um, Kelly was saying? If he believed the U.S. should welcome something bet- somewhere between zero and one refugees into the country annually, I like. What do you mean somewhere? Be- between- I mean, I, my take on that was he's literally suggesting we chop up a refugee and you know stick their head on a pol- on the a White pipe. House fence, you know, as a warning Pointing or to the something. Others. That that was crazy, and this is yeah. one of the adults in the room, supposedly. Well, that's one way to making a it. statement like that. Anyway, sorry. Uh, it, it's good. I, I it's kind of horrifying what we've become. It is. It's uh, it makes my skin crawl. That said, what's represent what's done in my name, supposedly with your tax dollars, my yeah. tax dollars. But that said, I think um, there's a desperate yawning space for actual conservatism. Actual conservative praxis and values. And I think it's only ever going to be localism in the American context. Because we're so fragmented. Because we're so fragmented. All, all it can ever be is really localism and what works where you are. Um, I'd like to see a little more formal cooperation between these disparate groups that are sort of an emerging conservatism in the United States. Mm-hmm. Um and I'd really like to see them just kind of, it would mean a lot to me if they would just walk away from national politics nation, altogether. From national <laughs> politics altogether. From the folks who describe themselves as, con- the liberals who describe themselves as conservative. Uh-huh. uh-huh. They really need to walk away from that. Just put down the keyboard. Just put down the put keyboard. Down the walk away. <laughs> cell phone. Go to City Hall and see what's happening. Well, that's what I kept thinking while you're talking about this is this is stuff that you can't really do sitting around on Facebook. No, not really. I mean, now mind you. There's local organizing via social media. There's local organizing via social media. What I think is actually powerful and valuable on Facebook is knowing as a person with conservative tendencies, I mean, I mean, actually conservative tendencies, mm -hmm. not not national review, um, knowing that you're not like just howling in the wilderness? That would be nice. That's that's really rewarding. Um, I feel like that like that as someone with very leftist values. You're kind of out in the wilderness. Yeah, that's why I listen to these podcasts. Uh, there are other people so you feel out less alone. there. Yeah. Um, but I think that what hopefully my, my coworkers are secretly leftist. Some some of them quite. Oh really? Yeah. That's sort kind of, of exciting. It's taken me years to sort of. Because the leftists don't want to get out of the work. You are have, you kidding? You have to sort of do some discreet signaling and no passing. Oh, yeah. did they? Did they? Did they do the handshake? <laughs> anyway, sorry, I shouldn't. I've said too much already. I've said too much already. Yeah, step back, step back. Somebody said it for damage control. Um, but seriously, I think hopefully those connections where you stop thinking of yourself as just some kind of freak. Because you know there are other people who think these things. Yeah. No. Well, we'll, you leave, know, we'll make I, I've you. I kind of just accepted that that's my lot in life. Honestly. <laughs> well, hopefully that'll make you or give you enough courage to act locally. This isn't just some crazy idea that hey, maybe we shouldn't send all the smart kids off. Maybe they should stay here. Mm-hmm. Hey, maybe we shouldn't just sell the. Let's chain them up. <laughs> <laughs> Let's give them jobs here. Yeah. Let's give. Let's find something for them to do here. Find How about that money we're about them. to give to Amazon? Let's just keep that money here and keep the smart kids here. Yeah. yeah. Or something. Let's build them a Stargate. Let's build them a Stargate. <laughs> Maybe they'd stay then. So I think it's possible. I think something good can happen. My fondest hope, and people always shudder when I say this, but my fondest hope 
is that we can recapture some of the good of the Middle Ages. Because <laughs> things are about to get pretty bad. And I think that's the best we can hope for. I, and I don't think it's actually that bad to hope that. I, I, I You've got me now imagining what a much different life trajectory might have been for, for me staying in my community and some yeah. finding something meaningful to do there that fed what I needed, which was to develop my mind, you know? Right. Well, and honestly, you aren't that unique. Absolutely not. Right. No, there are lots of, you know, creative. Oh yeah. There were people the who, other, the other, uh, kids who got on their SATs when I got on mine have not, have gone, not gone back, back. either. Right. Yeah. They're gone. Yeah, so you know, for the most part, that's that's something. But again, that's not something you, as an individual, could have done. No, because that is a no. community effort, and you have no. So I want you to have study to have a community com- that wants you. I want to study computer science, and yeah. you have to want the community. It has to be yeah. this symbiotic relationship, and that's what he's talking about about pre political. But uh, not just it's a matter of relationship. Not just yeah, and it, it, I was looking for a community, right? And I still am. You know, oh, yeah, but yeah, I was. Look, I mean, that's that's why I wound up in Ann Arbor because they at at the at least at the time when I moved there, they had so many cool bookstores. They had so many, you know, movie societies. They had so many, you know, oh yeah, film festivals. Film festivals. They had all these things that I was fascinated by. Right. And Erie did not. <laughs> so, yeah. There and, is that. Anyway. Which I, I had the opposite impression, opposite experience coming to the well, Midwest. Well, you came from from close to Manhattan. You yes, know, you, very, you could go to Van- Manhattan to to I could go for to the Montreal day for the day or the Montreal for the day and do stuff there. And do stuff and come and back did. home or go to the next town and do stuff. Right, you know, but um, and did yeah. This, you know, it's it sounds pretty pathetic, but to me, after four years and five years in Worcester, Ohio, mm-hmm. uh, Ann Arbor was a bit of a cultural Mecca. <laughs> you know, I mean, Just you can, it was, you can yeah. laugh, but, but hey, yeah. they had records, they had independent bookstores and record stores, right? Borders was here. Borders was here and it was cool back then. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, so, so th- anyway, give the name of the article and the, uh, the article publication gets- and I'll put the URL in the show notes. Conservatism fails to act responsibly. It's an article written by Matthew Loftus, uh, Matthew Loftus on Mere Orthodoxy. Mere Orthodoxy is the website. Okay, yeah. cool. I've got like three real quick topics. Can we do... Are they real quick? Like 30 minutes quick or like three minutes quick? Uh, we're going to make them three minutes quick. Okay. Bam, let's do it. Okay. The first is I, I took on this situation with George H.W. Bush and the groping. Oh, yeah. And I've gotten pushback, you know, which, you know, I'm glad to have people answering. Yeah, pushback's always good. But uh, my take, again, is now there's four women who have come forward and told essentially the same story. Mm -hmm. And they're very credible. You know, there's nothing like, there's no real thought that they're lying. They're lying. Right. No one's denied it. No one's denied it, and the his him and his team and handlers and family have issued an apology. Right, it's kind of a vague apology. Right, but um, they're getting attacked. The women are getting attacked. Oh, please! Right, as you know, leave the man alone. He's ninety three years old, a war hero for God's sakes. He's in a wheelchair. He has Parkinson's and whatnot. I'm like, no. How about you know? How about we not? We not because um, this is a failure not just of him to control himself and I I don't know but I've never heard anything to suggest that he was like like a Clinton or like a Trump or was a was a I've predator. I've never heard that about him before. I've never heard yeah, that about him. So let's say just as he's aged and in the last few years in a wheelchair he's sort of lost some of his inhibitions towards. And and finds it amusing to make bad jokes about grabbing women's butts. Yeah, but it's not. In he needs to be told that this is not okay. Right, you're not and allowed to do that. That you're not allowed to do that. And instead, I believe his family and his wife Barbara are enabling him. 
Yes. And his handlers are telling the women as they leave, well, we do hope you'll be discreet about this little incident. And Barbara is joking, oh, he's going to get arrested some t- someday doing someday. that. But he keeps doing it. And I'm sure it's more than four times. It sounds it's just yes. a little thing he does. It's a little thing he does. It's not they charming. All know he does it. Yeah, it's not charming. It's not cute. It's disgusting. And if if they know he's going to do this whenever some young woman shows up doing her job by interviewing him on some issue, right? Maybe they should sit them across from each other and like warn him and keep an eye on it. Yeah. Or I'll say, I'm sorry, he's not well enough to, to in- have interviews anymore. Well, here's, here's the thing. It comes down to two things. Because <clears throat> people are saying, oh, well, he's elderly and infirm, and he's um, not aware of what he's doing, right? Sure. Or, does, or, or he knows exactly what he's doing, right? And it, honestly, it doesn't matter. Yeah. It's... Because if he knows what he's doing, you shouldn't be enabling him. Right. And if he doesn't know what he's doing... You shouldn't be exposing him to this humiliation. Right. You should be protecting him from himself. It's almost, I mean, would you like say, um, if he, you know, if he was going to shit himself in public, would you put him up, I mean, not that he's in a wheelchair, but you'd put yeah. him up at a podium so he could shit himself and then let the media make fun of him? I, no, you no, would protect him from that kind of humiliation. Right. You know, if, if, if he's got this problem, you'd protect him from public humiliation. Right. And right. as his wife, as his handlers and as, whatnot, you would you would avoid this situation avoid where he situation. does embarrassing on his things behalf. on camera or in a meeting or whatnot on he, his behalf. Right. Because it, as yeah. as it is, his his legacy, the like the last chapter of his of his Wikipedia entry is gonna have notes about all the groping you know, incidents. Groping incidents. And it's going to really be a kind of a sad, stupid footnote to this otherwise fairly distinguished life and career. Well, distinguished is a matter of taste. Distinguished. <laughs> but um, yes. I, I'm not here to rip George H.W. Bush, right? Yeah, war criminal. But <laughs> but that aside, I'm really here to say, you know, none of these people need to be enabling him if he knows what he's doing. And none of them, all of them have a responsibility to protect him if he's ill. And he And he's not the vulnerable one, even though he's an elder and whatnot right. but the young women at the start of their career who are now being attacked on oh, social yeah. media by all the attack the right-wing attack dogs are right they're vulnerable yeah okay that's okay. two minutes carry on <laughs> sorry okay another quick one which is that according to polls the majority of democrats now view george w bush favorably that was quick wasn't it yeah amazing turnaround from yeah been told what to think, now they Pe- think it. And they have always, uh, so many, so many like liberal left, uh, you know, thinkers have always said, yeah, the thing is about the the Republicans, they're all, it's always like, what did uh, Romney say? It's an etch a sketch. You know, right. you've got your, the stuff you campaign on, and then you shake the etch a sketch, and you're, it's all new, it's all an all new agenda. Now. It's a clean slate. Yeah, here we have a really clear example of just Democrats just. Having their etch a sketch shaken, and then they're like, Boing. Oh, either was, they yeah. don't remember or they just. I don't know. I don't I, I can't, don't I can't see what's in their head. Well, people change. So, are you going to, uh, are you going to join in this protest November 8th, 7 p.m.? Oh, God. Come on, Jesus. Facebook group, scream helplessly at the sky because that'll help. Why the fuck would I do that? <laughs> Uh, no, seriously, why would I do that? <laughs> It'll make you feel better. <laughs> oh, come on. No, I'm like, you mean a general strike? Yeah, a general strike? Okay, now we're talking. Now we're talking. Can we all have a general strike <laughs> yeah, Let's have a general strike like, on no November 8th. No one shows up for no work. No one shows up for work November 8th. Let's do it. Yeah, Bam. Yeah, that'll happen. Hey, you know? And then one final thing, which is in our last show, we joked, I think the Democrats might be getting ready to actually run her again. The opening salvo was in the Washington Post. <laughs> the Washington Post. Michael Brenes, B-R-E-N-E-S, October 24th, historian and senior archivist for American diplomacy at Yale University. Mm. And the title, the smart Hillary guys. 2020, Trump better hope not. 
Clinton might not be a potential candidate now, but the political winds can change quickly. Recent American history is rife with presidential contenders who lost the primary or general election and then went on to become candidate in subsequent elections. Dissatisfied with the politics of the day, lured by name recognition and pre-existing loyalties, the public gave each of these candidates multiple chances at the presidency and handed several the keys to the White House. Yeah. Good times. Oh, my God. <laughs> How are these people so predictable? But I, I yeah. I'm not going to read more of the text it's quite a long editorial because he's like a he's a historian right so he's all all the historical all the history, so he's yeah. they're they're literally building the underpinnings they're starting to soften people up for the idea for this by talking well, about I all know the, you don't like her but all the important <laughs> historical parallels and the wonderful past events you mean like nixon like nixon he talks extensively course, about nixon, nixon right because that went really well oh god they're serious and again like oh, life has God. overtaken our most ludicrous fantasies right but this may happen watch happen. for it watch for it all right guys thanks for listening thanks for listening oh uh yeah no we did we did uh A brief, fe- feedback brief earlier feedback. Yes. Yeah. yes if you would like to send us feedback please leave us comments on the the uh, blog page or on the YouTube page, on the Facebook page, or on the Facebook page. There's yep. at least three venues. I'm on Twitter, Paul R. Potts. Yep. All lowercase, one word. So yeah. And uh, we will we will uh, take any feedback you would like to send us. And remember, uh, if you, you could would, just like yell at us too. You That's can cool. yell at us if yeah. you would like. We can take it. We have young children. Uh, if you would like a copy of A Fighting Chance by Elizabeth Warren. By Elizabeth Warren. Um, yeah, send us your mail address. I'll send it out. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.